either the president's lawyer or his press secretary did not tell the truth. I, I wasn't involved in the statement drafting at all. Uh, nor was the president. President weighed in as any father would. We'll dig into the contradictions and drama in the White House and the scandal involving House Democrats and their computers. It is their equipment and it's supposed to be returned. Well, I think there's extenuating circumstances in this case. Plus, we have some big changes in the St. Pete race for mayor and plans to cut taxes in Washington. We'll break it all down with our guest, U.S. Senator Marco Rubio, Florida Senate Majority Leader Wilton Simpson, Democratic State Senator Darrell Rousson, and Republican strategist Adam Goodman. This is Money, Power, and Politics. Right now, the White House and Congress are at a fork in the road. Remember, just two weeks ago, Sean Spicer was settling in as communications director. Chief of Staff Priebus was gearing up for tax reform, Twist. and Republicans decided to postpone a vote on health care so that they could wait for John McCain to get back so he could cast the deciding vote to save their plan. Instead, he cast the deciding vote to tank it. I will not vote for this bill as it is today. Then last week, a man known as the Mooch took Spicer's job, then took on and helped take out the chief of staff, which gave us a new chief of staff who immediately took him out this week. And we're going to let the people go if we have to. Yeah, and the new chief of staff said that starts with the guy who slung vulgar insults at his own team days under the job and bragged about not following a chain of command. Uh, I'm very proud to be reporting directly to the president. Oh, the sudden rise and fall of the mooch shows how the chief of staff, Kelly here, is trying to bring structure and discipline to the White House, and that could serve the president well. The chief of staff is supposed to be the gatekeeper to the president, and Kelly started this week by building the fence. From here, the White House and Congress will try to focus on passing tax cuts, and they are still taking what may be their last run at health care. And for the first time in seven years, both parties are finally working together on that. We need to keep trying on health care. If we fail on health care, we're going to fail on taxes. Meanwhile, we now know the president himself weighed in on the misleading statement about his campaign meeting with Russians to talk about adoptions. We know his son and others took that meeting to try to get dirt on Hillary Clinton. And we know the special investigation into Russia and the Trump campaign is expanding. And that brings us to this fork in the road for the president and Congress. And that brings us to our first guest in tonight's Spotlight. Senator Marco Rubio, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks oh, so much. Okay, the idea behind replacing the Affordable Care Act first was to save money to help pay for tax cuts or tax reform. Does failing to pass health reform up front hold up tax cuts? No, I think we can do tax reform without uh, doing the deal. It may be structured a little bit differently, but that wasn't the purpose behind doing this. The purpose behind doing this is that the system we have right now isn't working. Uh, healthier people are paying way too much in premiums in order to acquire insurance in the individual marketplace. Medicaid is on an unsustainable path. If the president fires Mueller for investigating his finances, should Congress then hire him right back to pick up where he left off? Well, I'm not going to speculate on something that I don't believe is going to happen and hasn't happened. Suffice it to say that I believe, I, I'm going to continue to say what I've said before. I have tremendous respect for former Director Mueller. I believe he was the right person for this job, and I believe he will conduct a fair and a thorough investigation of all matters within his jurisdiction, and he will issue findings that I believe are accurate, fair, and within the law. I believe that. I continue to believe that. And I will say one more thing. I think it is in the best interest of everyone, including the president and, of course, the country, that his work be allowed to move forward unimpeded so that there'll be no questions after it's done about what happened and what didn't. And that's my position. I continue to reiterate it. And I hope that uh, the administration and others will follow my advice in that regard. And so to be clear, you think that Mueller looking into the president and his family's financial dealings is within his jurisdiction? Well, I, I don't know what he's looking at. I don't know why people are speculating about that. Th those investigations is a law enforcement function. It's not shared with the public. So I have no indication of what he's doing. Suffice it to say that I believe that Director Mueller has the jurisdiction to take this investigation wherever it leads you and wherever the facts require you to look into. I don't know what he's looking into, so I don't even know if that's true. But obviously, he's not allowed to go on a fishing expedition, and I don't believe that he will. It's not who he is. It's not the kind of character he has. It's not been his history of public service. I have zero doubt in his credibility, and I have no reason to doubt it up to this point. Senator Rubio, thank you for, for, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much.
We have a deep dive on the Russia investigation, healthcare, and tax reform on our YouTube channel. Search for Craig Patrick's Money, Power, and Politics and click subscribe. You'll also find our investigations into wasted money and controversies on both sides of the aisle. And so here we are with this federal investigation with a powerful political figure who appears to have tried to intimidate the man leading it. We have this scandal that appears to involve financial crimes, maybe some hacking involving people from an adversarial foreign power. But this time we're not talking about the Trump campaign in Russia. We're talking about the other scandal involving the Democrats in Congress. Everybody settle down, please. Yeah, that's Florida Congresswoman and former Democratic Party boss Debbie Wasserman Schultz getting booed. Everybody settle down, please. She flamed out as DNC chair last year after leaked emails showed how the party played favorites by conspiring to defeat Bernie Sanders in favor of Hillary Clinton. That particular scandal does tie back to Russia because our intelligence community says Russia is responsible for the leaks that exposed the Democrats playing favorites, and the Democrats were furious about that. I do know that this is a Watergate-like electronic break-in, and anyone who would exploit for the purpose of embarrassment or something like that. But now Debbie Wasserman Schultz and other House Democrats are caught up in a different computer scandal brought on by her own IT staff. Let's start back in May when Wasserman Schultz lost her computer, the Capitol Police found it, and she really wanted it back. I'd like to know how Capitol Police handle um, equipment that belongs to a member or a staffer that's been lost within the Capitol complex and found or recovered by one of your officers. Well, the chief of Capitol Police told her it could not be returned to her because it was part of a criminal investigation, and she did not like that answer. If the member loses the equipment, says they lose the equipment, yes, and it is found by the Capitol Police, it is supposed to be returned. They went round and round on this during a budget hearing for Capitol Police. It is their equipment and it's supposed to be returned. Well, I think there's extenuating circumstances in this case. And now we know what some of those extenuating circumstances are all about. It appears to tie into Imran Awan, the IT director from Pakistan she hired in 2010. After she hired Awan, several other House Democrats hired him as well. Then Awan's wife and brothers and friends showed up on their payrolls. We don't know exactly what kind of work the friends and relatives were doing here because no one appears to have seen them showing up for work. But they still collectively made more than $4 million off of taxpayers until they fell under investigation by the feds for overbilling computer equipment and got fired. Or check that, they didn't all get fired. Debbie Wasserman Schultz kept Awan on the payroll as her IT advisor, even though he was under criminal investigation and his access to the house IT system had been cut off. We simply don't know what kind of work he had done on her own computer. We just know she demanded that Capitol Police give it back to her. Members equipment is members equipment. And now fast forward to July. Awan was arrested for bank fraud last week at Dulles Airport as he was trying to leave the country. Only then did Wasserman Schultz fire him, which leaves quite a few questions like how did this family from Pakistan wind up in charge of computer systems at some of the highest levels of the federal government? And did they extract sensitive information from their computers? The feds are still looking into that. And why was Ladies Debbie Wasserman Schultz so agitated about her computer winding up they in the hands of police to the point of threatening the chief the with consequences if she did not right. get it back? If the member loses the equipment, says they lose the equipment, yes, and it is found by the Capitol Police, it is supposed to be returned. I can't return the equipment. I think you're violating the rules when you, when you conduct your business that way and should expect that there would be consequences. Okay, please welcome our next guest, State Senator Daryl Rusan. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And by the way, in the interest of disclosure, you were a supporter and donor of my last bid for nonpartisan office 16 years ago. Uh, today, <laughs> I want to talk about controversies involving the Democratic Party because it goes beyond Debbie Wasserman Schultz and the computer scandal. Uh, let's start with the chair of the state party, Steve Battelle, calling members of the Legislative Black caucus childish. Was that a racist thing for him to do? Well, it was an un un unfortunate thing for him to do. It was wrong. Uh, I think he addressed that as a party. We must move forward. It's important that we move forward. Unfortunate error. Was it racist? Yes. 
You also have the executive director of the party saying conversely her job was to shut down white people when she was in Idaho and she's picked from Idaho to lead Florida then later says she's not concerned about issues. She later retracts that. Uh, your thoughts on that. Uh, are those distractions? Is it something you can move fully forward beyond? We have to move fully forward beyond these types of erroneous, wrong-headed, intended statements. As a party, we must remember the principles upon which we were founded and operated on for so many years when we occupied the governor's mansion in the state of Florida, when we had the Senate presidency, when we had the speakership of the House, and it's those principles that will carry us forward. In the state Senate, you vice chair transportation. What are the prospects, if any, of high-speed rail ever coming back? I believe it's good. I believe we must continue to work for it. You think it's good, but the prospects of getting there, of moving the ball to where we were several years ago well, before Governor Scott killed the deal. The Tibarta bill that Senator Lotvala and I co-introduced in the Senate seeks to start the first steps towards that. Uh, it seeks to streamline, reduce the number of partners, uh, make it more meaningful, more substantive, and changes transit, transportation to transit so that it's inclusive of all methodology of transportation. What more can the legislature and will the legislature do next year and beyond to alleviate traffic in the Tampa Bay area beyond the prospects of rail? We must work to enforce all aspects of transportation. Uh, it may include some roadways, some freeways, some toll lanes. It may include the expansion of airport and light rail. It may include expansion of seaport and ferry boats. But the, the point is we must do something. It's time out for studying this problem. We must in, embrace opportunities for solutions. Senator Rusan, thank you for your time. Thank you. Now, coming up, we could have some big changes in how our state deals with sinkholes. Senate Majority Leader Wilton Simpson will break it down. And we have some interesting changes in the St. Pete race for mayor. St. Pete, around 3,000 gallons of partially treated wastewater leaked onto the ground due to heavy rains on Wednesday. The city says that spill was contained on site, and the city said the system did work through a tropical storm, which on that point is a bit at least of good news for Mayor Kreisman, who is in the fight of his political life. And I see our recycling bin just floating away, so I ran out there to grab it, and then I'm like, I'm looking at the water, I'm like, what is this? This was Tropical Storm Emily swamping the streets of St. Petersburg, and it marked the first big test for improvements in the city sewer system. It failed in heavy rains last year and released millions of gallons of partially treated wastewater into the bay. We were trying to prepare for this. But this time, Mayor Kreisman and his team appear to have passed the test. While the sewer plants are still being renovated, Kreisman said the system held up through a tropical storm because they've already increased capacity. You know, this is normally 18 to 24 month process and they're getting it done in less than a year. But that bit of good news for Kreisman follows a couple of big setbacks for his reelection bid. First, a state report blamed the Kreisman administration for the wastewater spills the past couple of years. It also faulted 20 years of mismanagement for contributing to it, which would include eight years of his challenger, former mayor Rick Baker. But it focused on Kreisman's decision to close the Albert Witted plant before upgrading the remaining plants to make up for lost capacity. In effect, ignoring recommendations from an experienced and reputable engineering company, according to that state report. And that, of course, gave Baker an opening to pounce in their last televised debate. Then after that, Kreisman hit another snag by losing the endorsement of the Tampa Bay Times, which can have a lot of clout in St. Pete elections. The Times endorsed former Mayor Rick Baker. Well, now, on last week's show, I critiqued an ad, a pro-Baker team ad, uh, called out some issues I found with the facts that was produced by our old friend Adam Goodman, and you were not happy about that. We decided we would air out our differences right here and now. Those differences, in a nutshell, would be? Rick Kreisman, uh, as mayor, uh, created what was called the calamity of the century releasing 200 million gallons in, into the bay because of his, of his decision to close the Albert Witted treatment plant. I called you off for calling it the biggest environmental disaster in our history. And I went through all kinds of lists, found Chernobyl, found a lot of things, didn't find release of wastewater. In our history meaning our being the city of St. Petersburg. You didn't say that, you said our history. 
Well, of course, the whole the whole spot was about the city of St. Petersburg. I thought that was understood. And the calamity of the century, which was the uh, site used to reinforce that point of view, came right out of one of the largest environmental groups uh, out there. So you feel very good in its validation. I had a source involved in one of the campaigns over in St. Pete who said that Baker ad guy Adam Goodman uh, believes when you get in campaign gear, you play a little loose with, uh, with the facts. You're not as completely tightened together on the facts during campaign gear. Uh, is he right or wrong? Oh, totally wrong. I mean, first of okay, all... Okay, let me stop you right there. Uh, he's wrong. <laughs> this right. is the soundbite I want you to listen to. Got I'm going to reveal the source who says that uh, Baker ad man Adam Goodman believes that when you get in campaign gear, you play a little loose and tight, uh, loose with the facts. Take a look. And I think when you campaign, you have a little bit more license to be um, maybe not as completely tight and together on the facts as <laughs> as uh, as you are when you govern. Because but when I you like govern, you put that. <laughs> yeah. as a campaign professional, I hate to yeah. say that, but yeah. it's true. Hate to say that, but it's true. Well, Rick first, Baker, ad man, Adam Goodman. There you have it. Good night, everybody. But there's more to it than that. Yes. You were talking about the president. You weren't talking about the race in St. Pete. That was back in February. It wasn't today. And knowing you as I do, that is not a proper characterization of your work. I know that. But I played that soundbite mm -hmm. as an illustration to try to explain the frustration and the concern that the marine scientist had in being included in your ad saying, these are bacteria that are going to make that make us sick. Well, I'm clear I, the, that, that bacterial science that you're talking about was in a newscast that we basically took a clip unedited from and used as part of our broadcast. First but, of but all, stop you right there. It was edited. I know because you took it from us without our consent. And the full context of the ad was that the levels in the water were indicators for that kind of bacteria. He wasn't saying that the bacteria will make the, us sick. Uh, number one, uh, so that changes the context at least somewhat. And then so playing it one water, year later can create the perception now, that from a spill of last year, bacteria are going to make us sick in the here and now. That was my point. The Fish and Wildlife Commission, Craig, said, and I'll quote, this created an acute public health hazard. The reason it cre created a public, a public health hazard is what was going into the water and what was not coming out of City Hall was the truth. Let me put it this way. Marketers have for many years put experts and well-known people into their ads to give their pitches third-party validation from people their customers know and trust. They've been making ads that way for 50, 60 plus years. And so it's wired into how people perceive them. And so political ad makers play off of that and take snippets from people without their consent to weave them into a narrative they don't necessarily accept. And that was uh, a big part of the concern the scientist raised in calling out the ad, which we looked at in last That's, show. Fair game or not? Uh, not fair, because uh, frankly, we did not recruit the scientist. The news program recruited it, and we didn't edit his comments. We, we used it as he said it on that program. So we will agree to disagree. But the one thing I hope we do have common ground on here, Craig, is this was an environmental disaster reinforced in those words by the Tampa Bay Times editorial, lead editorial about a week ago. It was an environmental disaster. It was a, a, a determined by the Fish and Wildlife Commission to be willful, not just negligent, but willful, and it rests at the feet of the current mayor. I enjoyed jousting with you. Loved Thank it. you so much. Thank you. We'll be right back. Well, please welcome State Senator Wilton Simpson, who is the Senate Majority Leader. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me here today. Should the legislature do more to make sure that owners and tenants darn well know if they're living in a home with a sinkhole history? I think the answer to that is yes. So we've looked at legislation um, that would um, warn homeowners. Some homeowners have bought homes where people 10, 12 years ago took sinkhole money and never made repairs to that home. So there is in fact a risk today that someone could be purchasing uh, or more likely maybe even renting a home not knowing that it has a sinkhole history. That's correct. And what happened was is because um, some folks called it the blue collar lottery, where folks would get a, an engineer to come in and identify that there was a sinkhole under their home. They would take the policy limits and sell the home for 15, 20, 30 cents on the dollar and leave. Those became a lot of rental homes in the area. But there are other cases, as I've served in the legislature, where um, people have bought homes that had a sinkhole that wasn't repaired, that went through um, not that process, but just the previous owner did not disclose it to the current owner and now they have a major sinkhole under their home. The other owner got policy limits 
and now this owner can't um, get the home or they have to pay for those repairs out of their pocket, which is most of the time and sometimes many hundreds of thousands of dollars. Addressing that in the legislature seems like a no brainer. So is this going to happen next year? It, I would guess. Yes, I believe it will. What about reining in development more in sinkhole prone areas? Yes or no? When you, I think that in sinkhole prone areas, there may be an extra layer of geology um, work or ge you know th those types of processes that may need to be done before those um, um, properties are built on in larger scales. And that's something we can look at also. I think it's very important. Senator Wilton Simpson, thank you for your time. Thank you. Now coming up, the president's plan to reel in legal immigration. The president has embraced a bold and controversial plan to change our system of legal immigration by which, if passed, individuals would be scored on a point system based, among other things, on their skill sets. Are they in demand in terms of a prospective job in this country? Can they afford their own health care? This would be a significant change. Uh, the problem here in getting it passed is that it's hard to get much of anything passed and it could run the risk of juicing up illegal immigration if people cannot get here legally. Uh, folks, that is our show. We will continue to follow the investigation into leaks as well as the investigation into Russia and much more next week. We'll see you then.